This is Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm excited today to be here with Gus Speth, who's got, I would say, more experience than the next 20 people I know related to dealing with climate and environmental issues. He worked in the Council of Environmental Quality in the Executive Office of President Jimmy Carter. He's run programs on development at the United Nations. He recently, and we'll be talking about this today, worked with a legal initiative on behalf of the protection of the future for young people. And the book that he has distilled that's recently come out is called They Knew, the U.S. federal government's 50-year role in causing the climate crisis. We're at a time when people are terrified about not addressing climate change and to understand this textured history and which you might call how, how we have to change in the Biden years and beyond will, is a follow on. But Gus, thanks for being here and thanks for illuminating so much in this very important realm. But let, let's just start with why, why did you write this book? What, what's the story and, and what's the sense of purpose that you have? Yeah. Well, thank you, Rob, uh, for having me. And uh, thank you for having this show. Uh, you, you mentioned my long experience with the climate issue, which I, I guess is true, but it's certainly not a compliment, is it? <laughs> we are having, uh, we've had so much uh, bad luck uh, and bad results in dealing with it, but uh, we can talk about that. Uh, and you're right. The book is not enjoyable uh, in, in that sense of books being in a pleasure to read. It's a difficult read, but it's a and, and a sad story. But there are some sad, difficult stories that need to be told. That's right. And I thought this was one of them, uh, because what I do in the book is recount the story, really from LBJ through Trump, of the federal government's uh, inaction and action uh, that impacted on the climate issue. And I got into this originally because the um, this wonderful advocacy for children out in Oregon, uh, our Children's Trust, had brought a lawsuit uh, on behalf of 21 young people. Uh, and it was actually six years ago now that they brought this. And, uh, and, and with the idea of demanding that the federal government uh, come forth with a truly responsive program on the climate issue and, and basing that on a constitutional theory. So it was intriguing. Uh, it's still in the courts, unfortunately. Um, but I was asked to do this history because part of their case is, is making the claim. And I think the book validates that claim, validates it very powerfully, that the federal government uh, has knowingly uh, continued to and perpetuated and expanded the U.S. fossil economy with the result that uh, we have knowingly put into the atmosphere tremendous amounts of greenhouse gas, uh, with the result that the federal government is a major player in endangering the future of young people. Not just a passive player, but a major active uh, player. Uh, that has uh, brought about this endangerment of young people. And, and so part of the theory, uh, you know, part of the book is, is going through each administration and each Congress and, and looking at what they knew about the climate science, what was presented to them about climate science, uh, what they were presented in terms of alternatives to the fossil economy, uh, going back to Jimmy Carter, uh, and thirdly, uh, what they actually did. And what every administration did during this period, unfortunately, was to sustain, expand, uh, facilitate uh, the fossil, our fossil, our tremendous reliance on fossil fuels. So it started out with 90% of our energy in the, in the Carter years, it's gone down to 80% today, not a precipitous drop at all. And meanwhile, our total energy use has gone up. Uh, so the um, amount of greenhouse gas emissions that we're putting out today 
is up significantly rather than down dramatically, like it should have been. That's the, basically the arc uh, of, of the book. There's some important details along the way, uh, but the truth is that no administration has risen to the occasion. Well, to get, uh, I, I want to get into the details of the different administrations that you illuminate in the book, but I want to first ask you the question, what's going on in our democratic process that we are so systematically resistant to taking care of future generations? Is it unmindfulness? Is it corruption? A little of both? Well, how, do, how would you diagnose why we're not doing the right thing? Well, there are a lot of wrong explanations out there uh, for why we haven't dealt more effectively with the climate issue. One is that, oh, it was the climate was so, un, the science was so uncertain. The theory was not proven. And uh, you hear that a lot. And even that it's a hoax, the whole thing from mm -hmm. our previous president. The merchants of doubt, they called them. Yeah. The merchants of doubt. And, uh, and there was, you know, the, at one point, the Exxon and others in the fossil industry launched a disinformation campaign to uh, sow these seeds uh, of doubt. Well, the book sort of puts that to rest, I hope, forever and ever, because what it does is it traces throughout this whole 50-year period what was known about climate science and what was presented to each administration. And the... Um, the, and, and the pattern that that comes out is that, that basically the science was really well understood, uh, well back in the Carter years, understood well enough, and and we we know so much more now, uh, and and so much more profoundly about the science of the climate issue, and uh, but the basic outlines of it were well understood uh, in 1980, say, uh, and and some would argue much earlier. Uh, but certainly, uh, so, you know, the whole, if there's a hoax, it's a climate denial, uh, not the climate reality that we have uh, today. And so you ask, well, what, you know, so one thing the book, I think, tells us, in effect, is that the, the, the good science and the kind of comfortable advocacy that we've all had, and maybe many of us participated in, uh, that comfortable advocacy and good science combined is necessary, but not in any way sufficient because mm -hmm. it has not moved the needle very much. And so you have to ask why. And you get into the obvious answer, really, the tremendous political power of the fossil fuel industry, uh, which has uh, you know, not only affected public understanding of the issue to the point that misunderstanding has largely captured one of our major parties, uh, but you also, uh, you know, have uh, a lot of uh, scared politicians who fear what the fossil fuel industry will do with their contributions, will say in their districts. Uh, and you see that happening right now with, uh, you know, a lot of major corporations uh, running ads uh, against the uh, uh, Biden reconciliation package yep. so yep. Uh, it's um it's not a mystery that that our politics have been tremendously affected by the power of the fossil fuel industry and um but there's also other things i think uh we are hooked on growth and when when you have an economy that's uh fueled uh 80 90 percent by fossil fuels uh you know you people are scared to touch that uh, to really threaten that because it, it's perceived as a threat to growth. It need not be, but it's perceived that way. And thirdly, you have a um, an ideological component. Uh, you have a, a powerful group in our country that uh, has taken to heart and expanded on Reagan's uh, injunction that uh, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem, Reagan said. And uh, and there's, so there's this uh, ideological anti-government, anti-regulation uh, uh, group that's very powerful and opposes the government intervention, so-called, in, in the economy. Uh, and is very free market oriented, uh, pro-corporation 
and um, and uh, and so that I think those those factors have combined to give this issue tremendous inertia, and and, uh, and we uh, we need to look at look for different ways to tackle the problem. I think. Yeah, I made a podcast last year with uh, Seth Klein, Naomi Klein's older brother, and his book called "The Good War," and it was about using the analogy of Canada's preparation for World War II. They entered the war before the United States did. But that process, that transformation of how you organize society and propelled the adjustments and transformation, he's then deploying to, how would I say, address Canada, which is both a big producer and consumer of fossil fuels, and how we go through that transformation. Other people I've talked to, Bob Pollan and others, have talked about the lesson that many working class people in America have, which is when there is a profound transformation, we do not do the equivalent of trade adjustment assistance. And so, as you mentioned, with the fossil fuel industry being a structure upon which we're so dependent, it's quite frightening for people to think that we're going to go through a profound transformation and they're going to get left out behind the door like they have been in some cases with automation or global free trade vis-a-vis uh, China and the global south. So there's there's a lot of dread on the one hand. On the, hand, on the other side, there's dread that we're going to destroy life on Earth. And how we come out of that logjam, I think, is important. And then I also wanted to echo what you said which is Reagan saying government's part of the problem, not the solution. But I know a lot of people on the left now that don't trust government because they think it's captured by money and politics. My research director at INET, Tom Ferguson, has articulated that. People like uh, Professor Gillins and uh, Ben Page Mm -hmm. have written about how, if you will, the top 10 percent's view of the income distribution matters more than the bottom 90 in many legislative initiatives. So I think the the resistances to progress that you're citing are very important. And I could imagine the frustration of a scientist like James Hansen, who I think worked with that uh, lawsuit in preparing uh, for in Oregon. My, by the way, my sister is a veterinarian who runs a hospital in Eugene, Oregon. The first time I heard about the lawsuit was from her. But, uh, well, it's, it has gotten a lot of uh, good publicity, I think. Yes, yes. And, and, and I think that lawsuit, uh, which, as I say, was started about six years ago now, uh, brought, brought, by our, brought by our Children's Trust, was a, uh, became kind of an entering wedge, an opening for young people to get involved in the climate issue. And so much of the activism now is driven by young people uh, here and abroad, uh, symbolized by, by Goethe. Uh, but, uh, you know, they're... There are many others, uh, to say the least, and uh, uh, and I think we we oh, we, we give the the plaintiffs here, the young plaintiffs and their attorneys, a lot of credit for getting this moving. Um, yeah, you mentioned uh, the wartime mobilization. I think it's a good model. Uh, I think we need to think about what you know Canada did, what we did uh, to to mobilize uh, ourselves to get ready to go uh, and then participate in. In, in World War II, um, and uh, there are a number of uh, organizations that have picked this up, uh, including a group called the Climate Mobilization, which is modeled on on this idea. And you're you know you're also right that um, we have dealt poorly with uh, marginal groups, uh, vulnerable groups in in other transitions. But we talk about a transition. This this is imagine. I mean what. Even Biden, even President Biden is saying today is that we are going to basically get out of the fossil fuel business uh, by mid-century. So we're talking, you know, 30 years to go from 80 percent plus reliance on fossil fuels in our energy system down to effectively zero uh, by that time. Uh, Maybe a little bit, but not much different from that. A huge transformation and uh, and the reason that we have to make this huge transformation in such a relatively short period now 
uh, is that we squandered the last four decades. And the theme of the book is that, uh, a theme of the book is that we knew enough in the Carter administration, which I served in, uh, to put the, to uh, argue that there should be an upper bound on the buildup of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. We even put a number on what that upper bound ought to be. Uh, we were off uh, somewhat. But we we were uh, we knew that there should be a limit on what we were doing, and that that required a profound transformation in our energy system. And Carter launched a bunch of initiatives that dealt with uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency improvements. Uh, he did other things on the other side of the ledger, uh, but um, he set us on a path that if we'd followed, we could have had four decades of of effective transition and global leadership on the climate issue. But the pattern in the book, Rob, is that we've had three administrations during this period who understood that there was a climate problem, who decided that they needed to do something about it. None of them really were doing enough, but they all knew, these three knew that there was a problem and that they needed uh, to act. And in every case, what they did halting, partial though it be, was undermined by the incoming new administration. Mm. Mm. So we had Carter followed by Reagan, who took symbolically took the solar collectors off the White House and uh, meanwhile uh, uh, undermined everything Carter had started um, in this uh, new energy path area. Uh, we had uh, uh, Clinton and Gore uh, come in and uh, <clears throat> and wanted to do a lot on climate, uh, found that they were stymied uh, by the Congress in this case, but then subsequently what they were able to start uh, was undermined by the George Bush administration. And then thirdly, we had um, uh, Obama, uh, who you know, actually did more concrete things to deal with the issue than anybody, though he never uh, uh, saw the need to get beyond fossil fuels and ended his administration uh, praising what they had accomplished in promoting fossil fuel use, including fracking and exports of U.S. fossil fuel resources and other things. But you know, even though their work, work was far from perfect, they had been followed by the Trump administration. So you have these cycles. Uh, and I think the question before the country now is, are we getting ready to see another one of these cycles with uh, strong intentions and, and powerful goals uh, set by the Biden administration? And uh, are we seeing that uh, thwarted now and maybe even followed by a hostile administration, as has happened so often in the past? And, and this brings me to a key point of back to the litigation. Because what the litigation is seeking to do is to establish a constitutional principle that the federal government has to protect future generations and current and currently young people uh, from climate devastation. And uh, it's done the opposite. And, and uh, that that's a violation of their due process rights under the Fifth Amendment. And once you establish that there is a constitutional issue here that has to be acknowledged and followed, um, then that transcends an administration. Uh, that'll be true in the next administration, regardless of who is president uh, after the next election. And uh, so it, there's a, a real benefit in, in moving this to a constitutional issue. Uh, and, and I think that's one of the, the, the strongest arguments that, uh, that the plaintiffs in the lawsuit Juliana, the Juliana case, uh, have uh, at this point. Mm -hmm. So when we look at the, uh, what you might call the back and forth, you talk about the attempts and then the next administration undermining it. When you look at donations, from the fossil fuel sector, coal and oil, etc., are they, in this case, 
concentrated in the Republican Party? No, <laughs> no, no, uh, and and, uh, and and it's not just always donations. I, I, uh, I mean, I think the uh, the fossil industry uh, effectively spreads its uh, contributions around, and they know yeah. who their friends okay. are, and they're not always um, uh, they're not always Republicans. Although it is true that that pattern I mentioned was one of Republican thwarting whatever the previous Democratic administration had tried to do. Why do we look today at our uh, senator from West Virginia, uh, Joe Manchin, uh, and, um, you know, I, I don't think it's an exaggeration to call him a, a coal baron of sorts. I mean, he's heavily invested in the coal industry out there, and, uh, and, he, um, and he's a Democrat, and he has a significant income uh, from, from his coal investments. Uh, so, you know, I think we... Uh, we, we've got to uh, face the there are deeper problems than uh, than the immediate things. Uh, you know, you mentioned your friends who are skeptical of government. Well, I think that they have. You know, if you read this book and this history of tragedy, uh, this saddest story ever told, you know, over a fifty-year period. Uh, it's hard to get, you know, to it's impossible to conclude that the federal government, as we know it now, is going to rise to the occasion. Uh, and uh, you talk about skepticism of of what the government could do, but that leads me not to despair, or and I hope the readers not to despair, or uh, but to alarm and motivation to do things differently and get a different result. You know what? I guess it was Einstein that you know said that you can't keep doing the same thing and expect a different result. Uh, well, we we've kept doing the same thing and expecting a different result, and it hasn't worked. Um, I've got some examples of that I can tell you about, but um, uh, so we need to do different things now. Uh, we we have a, uh, a, a a different we need a different tack, and I'm happy to talk about that. But in the longer run, we also need uh, to make some deeper changes in our political economy. And and, and part of that is in our democracy. Well, you've been uh, involved for the better part of the last decade with the Yale School of Environment. And uh, I'm curious, as you're writing this book, this lawsuit, you're interacting with the students, you're seeing the dysfunction of the federal government. How are the young people reacting? How are, how are the people that you encounter at Yale University imagining meeting this challenge? Well, I think, I mean, not to talk so much about you know, the people at Yale, but more generally, uh, okay. I, I, think, I think the um, it, there's a, certainly a mixture, right? I mean, first, there's a uh, deep malaise uh, out there, uh, a, a, a fear, uh, an uncertainty uh, among young people. And uh, all the polls and, and a lot of the analyses, uh, you know, point this out. And uh, people are genuinely worried. Uh, on the other hand, it has motivated young people to really take up the issue. And I, I think of a critical moment when the Sunrise Movement, which is a group of young people, uh, decided to sit in on Nancy Pelosi's office uh, and um, and just stayed there basically until uh, she got religion on the climate issue. And, uh, and I think she has. Um, they've had a big effect and they continue to be disruptive. And I, I think uh, uh, the kind of demonstrations that are uh, peaceful and civil, legal, or maybe illegal if they're civil. Uh, the civil disobedience is a good thing. Uh, we need we're going to need a lot of it to get us through this crisis. But young people are at the helm of that now, and I think another group is uh, this Extinction Rebellion, uh, which is shown uh, in London and elsewhere how effective uh, it can be. So I've you know I've come to the conclusion that our comfortable advocacy, which is the path that I've been on, uh, is not enough. And we need a massive civil mobilization uh, 
doing a lot of different things, but all doing something dramatic at this point, because I don't know how to, uh, you know, we're, we're literally, as, as we speak, on the cusp of possibly losing, um, we're on the, you know, we're, we're on the verge of possibly losing the, the very things that uh, Biden, President Biden has proposed to do on climate. And if we can't get that done, uh, one does wonder if we'll ever get anything done and, and, and whether it'll be enough. Uh, I mean, he's made a decent start that needs our uh, every ounce uh, of our support. But, um, you know, it's just the beginning. Of, this is going to be a long-term issue. Mm-hmm. Well, I look at, uh, at the young people. I, I'm familiar with the group they call Justice Democrats, Zach Exley and Saikat Chakrabarty and uh AOC and all of them uh, right. working towards a Green New Deal. Right. And uh, so there, I think there are what you might call, whether it's think tanks or legislators embedded in this system that are on the right track, but do not necessarily have what you might call sufficient leverage. So that, right. that outside activism that you're talking about does appear to be uh, how I say essential to creating this momentum, and if we get set back with the Biden legislation in this next little window of time, it's I, it's very daunting. It's very daunting. Perhaps it will trigger that bigger uprising that you seem to suggest we might need. Yeah. Well, I definitely think we need it. I, I would say we, you know, there there's some. Um, the hopeful signs. Uh, one is that the media has decided now, belatedly, by decades, uh, mm-hmm. to relate some of the tragic events that are occurring in our weather and uh, patterns and storms and droughts and other things to relate those to the climate issue. Mm-hmm. In the mm-hmm. decades, they were unrelated in the media, like, uh, oh, no, that's something else. And there was even hostility on the part of uh, weathermen of the meteorological profession to dealing with the climate issue. Uh, I think we're beyond that now, and we're getting uh, much better coverage in the media of the climate issue. And, and, and we now have widespread climate victimization, uh, which is uh, – and the realization that people, you know, that they, the victims, are being victimized by the climate issue. And a number of cities going to court uh, to sue the fossil giants uh, for damages and other things, uh, consumer fraud in a number of cases. Uh, and um, so that's a big change. Uh, the media is a big change. The activism of young people is a very hopeful sign. And the, uh, and the picking up of these issues by some very effective people in the Congress. Uh, in the Senate and the House, and, and the sort of spearhead of that has been, as you mentioned, the Green New Deal. Uh, the Green New Deal, I think, is uh, a really uh, important initiative um, and uh, is uh, basically, you know, I, I can't get too upset about the difference between sort of Green New Deal 1 and, and, and Green New Deal 2, which I think of as what uh, Bernie Sanders and the president have been pushing uh, now. Uh, basically, uh, I don't think the president wants to call it the Green New Deal, <laughs> but it is. And uh, and we need to get it through. And we need to get it through in in, in, in a big way and, and not have it trimmed down uh, and, and have it thrown on the floor, as some, as some would advocate. Um, so... We, uh, we need this massive civil mobilization, and we need judicial intervention. Uh, we need the courts to get active on this issue, as they have in some European countries, uh, and uh, provide a, uh, a bright center line for the country to go down. And, and when it, the courts are not in the position to write climate policy, but it can demand uh, that climate policy be written and be implemented, and it can hold the federal government's feet to the fire. Uh, and the courts in Oregon in the, um, in the Juliana case have mandated the 
federal government to sit down and try to negotiate something with the plaintiffs in this case, with the with the young, you know, with the lawyers for the 21 youth plaintiffs. And mm -hmm. and so far, the Biden administration has refused to do that. Mm -hmm. So we need um, we need to um, uh, see a big change in the Biden administration. It's one of a number of examples where the Biden Justice Department uh, hasn't uh, really caught up with the Biden administration policies and still seems to be going forward with inherited policies from that last administration that we would like to forget. Mm. Mm. Well, one of the areas uh, where I've sensed some progress, and you mentioned the media, I, uh, I refer to the phrase, the merchants of doubt. I see writers now like Naomi Oreskes or Michael Mann at Penn State illuminating which am I called the, the propaganda techniques, unmasking the sowing of the seeds of doubt. And, and I think that with the anxiety related to episodes of the weather and heat waves that are just unprecedented, right. more and more people are, which am I call, inoculating themselves from the doubt by, how do I say, the illumination that Naomi Oreskes, Michael Mann, and others are are contributing to. So it's, right. it's, it's a glacial thing. It's not big enough. It's not fast enough, but it is a contribution. No, it's a, it's a huge uh, contribution, and, and I hope that my book will contribute more to that because yes. uh, it leaves really uh, no doubt about the reality of the climate science. As I reported the science as it was brought forth into each administration, uh, you know, it would have been one thing if, if it had reflected flip-flops, uh, if it had reflected uh, predictions that were wildly wrong and you know, off course, uh, if there was a lot of backtracking on the science, but there hasn't been. It's been a consistent theme, you know, from, from the 70s, uh, say, forward uh, until today uh, about the reality of the climate uh, threat. And, and the dimensions of that threat. I mean, you go back and look at what was written for LBJ about the issues that were going to be uh, uh, affected and, uh, and, and uh, you know, in terms of sea level, in terms of storms and heat waves and uh, other things, uh, droughts. It was all predicted uh, as, as, as a consequence of the climate issue way back in the 70s and 80s. And Carter did a lot, and I give him credit uh, for it. Um, I guess I'm giving myself some of that credit because I was there. But um, it's uh, uh, it, it hasn't it hasn't won over the day in any administration, and uh, and and we we now have a damnable situation on our hands where it's not going to be good. We are beyond a good result here. Uh, in terms of climate impacts. We are beyond uh, preventing terrible things from happening. Uh, they are going to happen, but they could be, you know, 10 times worse uh, if we don't act. So, you know, I wish it, uh, there were a sort of happy ending <laughs> to the story, uh, but there is a, there could be, a, 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 you know, a, a solution that uh, saves us uh, or a multiplicity of solutions that save us from the worst consequences. And, and that's what we need to do now. Uh, otherwise, it's really going to be a level of devastation uh, that, that you know we're not even beginning to imagine. Well, I, I want to explore a little bit with you. Uh, what I sense on the horizon is, is quite a dangerous uh, impediment, which is as the U.S.-China relationship becomes right. more and more tense, as the Trump administration kind of sought to demonize places like China and Mexico related to employment security. And, you know, we could say our government didn't do the adjustment assistance when Chinese manufacturing displaced a lot of manufacturing in America. But when I look at it now... Given the size and scale of China, United States, Japan, the EU, 
maybe rest of North America, you, you put those together, and that's about 70% of the fossil fuel burning on yeah. planet Earth. America wants to lead a world system. If we get into a military fracas with China, any hope for collaboration on climate goes down the drain. I am encouraged in the last couple of days, I've seen that the Biden administration and Xi Jinping are going to do a virtual summit in the coming months. Uh, so there is an attempt to keep the dialogue open and find the cooperative or collaborative solutions that are necessary. But I, I find it very haunting now how this what I'll call nationalism competition may enter the fray and stop the international collaboration that, that appears to me to be a necessary condition for meeting this challenge. Well, we'll have a test of uh, testing of the water, so to speak, of where we stand internationally coming up later this month uh, when the conference of the parties to the climate treaty mm -hmm. meet in Glasgow. Right. Uh, it it towards, starts towards the end of this month and goes into the next. And Senator Kerry, who's been you know, charged uh, by the president mm -hmm. to be our mm -hmm. international ambassador on climate, is, I think, making uh, big efforts to organize uh, an effective uh, U.S. presence at that meeting. Uh, and uh, and, and I, so we'll know a lot more uh, after, after that meeting. And I think a number of the things that are happening between now and that meeting could be hopeful as, as the one that you uh, mentioned uh, might be. Uh, the reality uh, is that um, we are down in the U.S. to about 15 percent a year of global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and China is uh, not twice as big, but almost twice as big, I think, as, as we are in terms of annual emissions. However, we are still the largest country by far uh, in terms of cumulative emissions. And, and what the environment cares about is the cumulative emissions and how much of the gas is, you know, we've put into the atmosphere. Uh, we're still the big culprit there. And, and you know, and, and the second largest emitter. And, and both, you know, because of that and because of the U.S. Uh, role in, in the world, uh, you know, our example is very important. And the ability to do things internationally is also linked to whether we have a strong base at home uh, or whether we have clay feet. And, and I think this is, you know, what Kerry is, is up against right now as he moves into Glasgow uh, is whether there's a, uh, uh, you know, he can talk about what the U.S. is really doing uh, and uh, on the climate issue or whether he'll go there as we say, naked, uh, with very little to, to say for his own country. Um, and uh, so we're at a critical moment on the international stage uh, for those reasons and the ones that you mentioned as well, um, you know, right now. And so it's not just the U.S. drama, so to speak, right. but the international one uh, as well. And I see a, a lot of what you might call need for collaboration in many dimensions. For instance, when I have been talking with people like Adair Turner, who is a British man, an Energy Transition Commission, he's been a fellow at INET, he describes to me that if you want to put solar panels in Norway, you pay an interest rate that's about 1% real, 1% above the rate of inflation. But Norway's dark a significant portion of the year. If you want to put those solar panels in an equatorial region like parts of Africa, the interest rate is about 8% above the rate of inflation. And so we're in a place now where if we just let the private credit allocation with its risk premium and so forth play the role, at a place where solar development could be most productive and make a very large contribution to all of our well-being, it won't get done without multilateral assistance, without some of which amount of all of us collectively absorbing that risk premium and deploying those energy systems in the in the global south. But uh, and I so I see I see the need 
for places like the World Bank and UNCTAD and others to really play a, a vigorous role in how we finance and deploy this energy transformation all over the world. It's not just a national thing. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And uh, I have to tell you, Rob, I'm impressed that you know uh, about the UN Trade Organization. There are not many people who go oak dead. Uh, and, uh, but it's, um, uh, the UN is very, very important. People don't appreciate that the UN is the sponsor, really, of these uh, conference uh, climate meetings hmm. and much else. We're getting oh. good leadership out of the Secretary General hmm. of the UN. Yes. And the UN can do other things on trade and intellectual property and yep. and uh, other issues. So we we need to you know uh, we need to uh, burnish our uh, uh, our um, uh, international bona fides uh, because we we've let them slip uh, so badly and have lost uh, some of our international presence and, and respect over the past several years. So we need to mm -hmm. reclaim that and. Um, Multilateralism is essential to dealing with this issue at this point, because as I, as I mentioned, you know, 85 percent of the emissions are coming from somewhere else. And meanwhile, the people that are going to be most impacted are those that had the least to do with causing the problem. And the developing countries uh, in Africa, uh, top among them, they're going to be, you know, it's already too late to hold back what I think are going to be hordes of, uh, that's a bad word, but lots of um, uh, of uh, climate refugees moving across borders to escape droughts, to escape floods, uh, agricultural failures, and and, and other things. Um, and this is, uh, so we, we it's, it's going to get worse in, uh, if we don't act now. And uh, so the full dimensions of this, uh, need to be appreciated um, and, uh, and and they're only beginning to be and so um, but it's uh, it's changing it's changing and uh, I think uh, each profession uh, academic profession has something major to contribute uh, yes. at this point and yeah. uh, including I would mention the faith communities because um, there's no sort of structure out there that can reach so many people so quickly uh, with a message that is inherently a moral message uh, mm -hmm. about care for each other and, and care for the future, uh, yes. as the faith communities can. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so, uh, you know, we need to we need to ascend to the pulpit, uh, those who can, and and take this uh, take this message there. Yes. Well, we've seen. Uh from the Vatican, Pope Francis has issued his last two encyclicals on environment, Laudato Si, and then the one for t taking care of one another and trying to set a, which we might call a moral North Star for us to aspire to as a society. At INET, we're trying to do our uh, part with the Joe Stiglitz and Mike Spence leading a commission on global economic transformation, where we talk right. about the disruptions associated with financialization, technology, environment, globalization, and the loss of the boundaries of and control of the nation state. And as you mentioned, the induced disruption associated with migration when things do not cohere in various places around the planet. And I, I think it's imperative for scholars to reach with the depth of their insights and their evidence-based awareness to not only diagnosing, but seeing the pathway, the remedies that need to be implemented right. and, uh, and, and well, none too soon. Well, Rob, I hope you'll uh, uh, tell Stiglitz to um, include in his uh, analysis the need to, to, as he has done in the past in some very important books, including Mismeasure, uh, the, the need to, um, to revamp our, our national accounts. Uh, mm -hmm. And to escape yeah. from this uh, tyranny of uh, of GDP, as yes. we now uh, re you know uh, 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 added up, uh, you know GDP is uh, is such a misleading uh, signal, and yet yes. it, you know, we worship at the author or uh, altar of uh, of GDP growth, and if uh, if they uh, you know we we can't afford 
to have um, uh, to have measures uh, as flawed as that uh, guiding us uh, into the future. So we talk about these so-called non-reformist reforms, reforms that are um, uh, you know, uh, that look like <laughs> changes that look like regular reforms, but have in them the seeds of much deeper change. And I think to move to a new system of indicators of progress beyond our national accounts and beyond GDP, uh, it would be a major non-reformist uh, reform because it would yes. lead to lots of other things. Well, I know Joe and uh, Amartya Sen and John Paul Fatusi and others worked very much on changing the nature of what, how we measure well-being. Uh, yeah. I had I had the good fortune of being in a conversation a couple of days ago with Ann Pettifer, and uh, she uh, has a quote from Bobby Kennedy that I want to share with you that echoes your perspective. He, Bobby Kennedy once declared, we're talking about GDP, it measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything, in short, except that, that which makes life worth living. <laughs> and, uh, and, and unfortunately, you know, that was his last speech. That's right. That's right. Uh, and his last big speech. And I, uh, so, um, well, anyhow, that's that's one change. But we're you know we're moving here, at least in my thinking, and 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 I'm sure in yours and your colleagues, uh, to some deeper changes that need to be made in the economy, because while we can do a lot now with the current system that we have, so to speak, uh, and we've got to, and I think Biden is challenging us to do that, um, and I hope he doesn't abandon his own proposals and goals. Uh, but the, you know, beyond what we can do in the current system, we need to start thinking about how do we change the system. That's and, right. Uh, how do we, you know, get a real democracy flourishing? Uh, how mm -hmm. do we escape this tyranny of GDP? How do we build a new system of uh, business enterprises that are uh, not uh, so completely oriented to to profit? Uh, how do we democratize decisions about investment? Uh, and have them focus on social and finance, and, and excuse me, social and, and uh, environmental returns, and, and, and not just uh, financial returns. You know, there's a whole world out there of, of deep changes that need to be made. So, you know, over time, to deal with the climate issue, we're going to have to introduce a lot of these changes. Uh, right now, you know, we need to go with what we've got, but. Um, Tomorrow, we need to be moving towards uh, deeper changes in the system. That's, uh, how would I say, music to my ears. The, uh, I'm a, and I think the, the I'm book a, really... The I've book got really four works. children and two grandchildren, <laughs> and I'm thinking and about their future. And, and, and the, how we say the specter of non-action is very, very daunting. And then I think it's no. coming alive in, in the spirit of more and more people about, like you said, the kind of change and, and making essentially the economy rather than a ruler a means to to the social ends that right. we would like to uh, to have our children experience well you you're so right and i think the book helps make this point because it does underscore that uh, that the system under different administrations and different political eras uh, that the system is has failed us i mean if there's a sort of well, the bottom line uh, coming from the book, it's it's one of a massive long-term system failure. Yes. And it does point to the need to change the system. I will say uh, I grew up in Detroit, Michigan, so I got a little foreshadowing of profound dysfunction and transformation of the economy as a, as a youngster. But... I was haunted. I was doing a conference in Detroit in 2016, three days after the presidential election when Donald Trump had won. And on election day, I was in Detroit and I went out with seven of my friends from high school, all of whom have MBAs, MDs, PhDs, JDs, graduate degrees across the spectrum. Of the eight people there, six had voted for Donald Trump. And I said, to them, what are you expecting? 
And they said, well, Rob, you know, you you moved to the East Coast and you raise your children there and everything's fine. Our families have stayed in Michigan. And Donald Trump, right after he got the nomination, came to Detroit and he said to the Detroit Economic Club, shame on the executives of the big three because they're not preserving jobs in America. Now, Donald Trump may have seduced and abandoned people to get elected, but what he was saying was the system is rigged. The system is dysfunctional. The kind of things that your book says. I view Donald Trump's election as a symptom of that dysfunction. Unfortunately, it didn't wasn't accompanied by repair. It might have exacerbated that dysfunction over those four years, and this is where the challenge for Biden and his team is now. But this the the thing that haunts me, Gus, and this is really the final question I want to explore with you, is someone like yourself, you have so much experience in the process with regard to climate, with regard to the technical and scientific issues, with regard to the people. I watch young people now, the kind of people that would read your book and nod yes, completely lacking in faith in leadership, governance, or expertise. How do we reestablish faith in governance or in institutions to meet this transformation? How do we reinvigorate belief in what expertise and science has been telling us for many years? I find that an enormous challenge, regaining trust in our society how do we how do we approach that dimension well you're right uh and it's a very very difficult uh very very difficult question if you as you as you know um we we've been at sea so to speak in terms of our appreciation of science for a long time i mean it's had roots that go back and uh, can be identified in the sort of half the country that doesn't believe in evolution for example and other rejections of, of science. Uh, this this has got to be, uh, you know, I think the scientific community needs a large scale, you know, program of of, tri- of science education, but also trying to communicate better uh, than than it does. Um, the, the the course, you know, there's no substitute in terms of building faith in government than success by government, right? Uh, I mean, there's nothing that's going to reclaim uh, that lost ground, uh, you know, that, that better or more quickly or more securely than uh, results that people can see and, and believe in. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't want to sound like a, a Biden sycophant uh, here, but I think he's I think he's he's got that. He understands that that message and he's trying to make. Uh, government work uh, and, and big government work. And it needs to, because we have huge problems that are national in scope. And, and they can really, there, there's a lot that big states like California and New York and others uh, can do. But, uh, you know, it really is going to depend on national leadership and national responses to, to deal with this uh, huge array of uh, you know, a dozen major problems of which uh, climate is one, and and you know you can rank them any way you want, but the truth is that uh, none of them are going to yield to uh, to half measures or partial measures or state measures, local measures. As important as those things are, we're going to have to figure out a way to build a strong, effective national government that inspires that confidence that you're talking about, and. Uh, and, and reinforces it in, in subsequent actions. So that's really, uh, I think, where we are. I'd like to think there was another solution. I don't believe the private sector is going to miraculously uh, save us, uh, change its spots, or that there's enough action at the state level that can 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 do the you know do the jobs that, that need doing. Although that's important. And and I certainly don't believe there are individual decisions about our consumer habits and. And, uh, uh, and, and, you know, and our uh, preferences for uh, electric cars or whatever else, you know, all the other important things. And all that is important. But in the end, 
uh, unless you know there's a these uh, these economic uh, engines are, are are national and global, and, and they are going to have to be tamed nationally and globally. And if there's any hope of getting down to effectively, you know, next to nothing in terms of uh, of uh, fossil fuel use by mid-century, um, you know, it's going to have to come from very powerful government action at the national and international level. And we're just going to have to get ready and, and, and be sure as best we can that that happens, because otherwise it's going to be, you know, very, very devastating for young people and future generations.